There we are. Yeah. We're live. Yeah. Okay. Hi, <laughs> hey, everybody. We're having a few technical difficulties this morning, maybe because we're having a blizzard in Minneapolis where we expect to get eight inches on top of the three or four we already had, which I have to say I love. I just, I live here because I love snow. Michael Tino, what do you got going on? Good morning, everyone. This is Michael Tino in Peekskill, New York. Um, it's uh, it's fake spring here. Uh, we're, we're enjoying uh, unseasonably warm weather before winter returns, and I have no doubt that it will. And the crocuses have poked their little sprouts up in the front of my yard, and you will all know when they're blooming. Hopefully that's not for a couple more weeks. How are you, Christina? I'm doing well. I'm coming to you from Charlottesville, Virginia. Uh, Virginia, the state where, you know, other states really wanted to claim um, that they were the most racist and Charlottesville said, hold my beer, or Virginia said, hold my beer. Um, we're, we're just, we're struggling a little bit right now, but uh, we'll make it through. Uh, Aisha. Hi, I'm Aisha Hauser in Seattle. Um, yeah, Virginia, <laughs> sorry, like what? Um, uh, yeah, we've had, we have ice uh, that I'm, you know, Seattle, I'm not used to this. I'm used to it when I lived in North Dakota, New Jersey, New Hampshire, Maine, but I'm a little annoyed, so this needs to stop. Uh, Jessica, who is near me in on Bainbridge Island, I'm waving to you right now. How are you? I can't even talk about the weather. I can't. It's so frustrating. <laughs> I'm encased in ice. This is not how I want to live my life. <laughs> um, yes. So, you know, Margali is amazing and is taking over tech for the view and is going to be fielding all your questions and comments and stuff. Margalee, how are you today? Hello, I'm okay. I am coming to you from Cromwell, Connecticut. And I can't say I have weather, weather woes like everyone else right now. I'm expecting something, but I'm okay right now. Okay. Margalee, where can people find you today? I will be on uh, Facebook. I will be um, looking over some of your comments. And if you have questions, I'll make sure that the panel is aware of your questions and your comments and so on. So that's great. Yeah, we're in the middle of a transition. We all have really appreciated Jessica's uh, tech support for these last months. And she's moving on to a different portfolio and Margalee is stepping up here. So it's sad and it's good all at the same time. I always feel when learning fellows are leaving, which Jessica is not, she's just getting a different portfolio. I always feel like, no, we'll never get anyone. And then someone else amazing comes. So we're just in the process of welcoming uh, Antonio Delgado to, to join us. So um, she won't be here on The View, but she'll be the new learning fellow helping with some of Jessica's other portfolio. Today as our special guest, we have Nancy McDonald Ladd from River Road UU Church, author of this new book, After the Good News. And we'll be talking about that in just a little bit, but first we're gonna do our UU Roundup. Let's see, where should we start? How about those ministers, Christina? Well, I am so impressed with what's going on at the UUMA, the UU Ministers Association. Um, so just this past week, we heard from uh, the EU Ministries Association that they are changing um, what was used to be termed um, final fellowship, which was kind of the final step in, in being um, a fellowshiped uh, ordained clergy member uh, in Unitarian Universalism to full fellowship. Um, as they seek to change from a learned ministry to a learning ministry. And just the work and effort that this group has gone through in the past year to really examine um, where they want to be as um, not just a, a, um, a professional organization, but a prophetic organization has just really been um, tremendously inspiring. They're um, going to be sponsoring for their members um, some conversations on collegiality. What does it mean to, um, to be collegial um, amongst um, the members of, the, of a professional organization? How do you hold each other accountable um, when you're in those collegial um, uh, spaces? So I'm, I'm really just thrilled at um, the direction uh, the UMA seems to be heading and um, give them lots of support and shout out. What else is going on out there? 
Well, me too. I just want to echo. I think that this idea that after three years, you know what you need to know and no more learning is necessary, any of us would say is preposterous. And so to actually name that and to, I think part of what it'll do, it'll give clergy some grounding in their congregation to go say, I, I'm required to do this, which I think will help everybody. The congregations to be cognizant of what ministers need to be learning and the ministers to continue learning. I also think that topic of accountability and collegiality is huge and um, deep and complicated and worthy of many, many conversations as we try to wrestle with white supremacy and what it means to be accountable to people in a white supremacist system. I mean, I just think, you know, there have just been rules of you don't, you don't ever talk and, and they haven't helped, especially people of color, but they haven't helped any of them us, I think. So yeah, I'm really, I, I agree. There have been some people working really hard and I don't know all their names, but thanks to them. Hey, Michael, speaking of people working hard, a group you were part of just wrapped it up, right? Yeah. Um, I, I forget exactly the, the task force's name, but uh, the moderators of the UUA put together a task force on elections, um, which consisted of the members of the presidential search committee and the members of the election practices and campaign committee um, put together. And I actually bowed out uh, of that group, but I know um, that they just had a great meeting to talk about um, how, how the UUA elects people and how we can, we can change um, mostly presidential and moderator elections uh, and the positions of president and moderator to be more um, accessible to, to people to be more democratic, uh, to be to in, involve more congregational participation in in the elections, um, and I think that they're going to have some really uh, exciting recommendations. I wasn't at their meeting, so I don't know what the recommendations are going to be, but I know the people who were in part of that group, and they're all pretty amazing. They met in Vegas, right? They did. Uh, you know, flights to to Las Vegas are subsidized, so it's. It's one of those places where from anywhere in, in the United States, it's fairly cheap to fly. Uh, so they picked it just because uh, it's a big group of people. Yeah. Uh, and the, the UU church in Las Vegas let them meet there. So they, you know, uh, it's not like they met in, you know, some... We designed the uh, Youth Ministry Renaissance module at Sam's Town Casino in Las yeah. Vegas. And uh, it, we all smelled like we'd been in a bar all week by the time we were done, just sitting in a suite. But what was great is I'd give people $5 and say, here's your meal allotments for the day because breakfast was a dollar, lunch was a dollar, dinner was a dollar for these huge buffets of all you could eat. <laughs> it was preposterous. But it was kind of silly. We did smell bad, but it was really cheap. <laughs> it was a very cheap meeting. So my cheap self applauds this. Anyway, Aisha, what's up where, in your neck of the woods? Um, uh, not much, uh, except, uh, yeah, nothing I can say publicly. But I have a question for Michael. Um, what is, I'm just keeping it real. Michael, what is that second group you said? Because I've never heard of them. And I'm like, I'm on the UUA nominating committee. How have I not heard of this election board? Who is it's, that group of people and who picks them? And, and Christina, you can correct me if I'm getting the name wrong, but it's the Election Practices and Campaigns Committee. And it is a, a it. committee of the board. Yes. It's it's appointed by the board. Oh, okay. So now I'm and embarrassed that I didn't know that. They're, they're the people who actually run commit run the elections and, and monitor the rules of the elections. So just for president and moderator? Christina... I don't know if they have a role in like the trustee elections or the elections for the other committees. Actually, um, I'm not certain about that. I, I know they're I'm more familiar with their roles in the moderator and presidential elections because we just had those elections while I served on the board. Um, and, and it was interesting because, you know, we hadn't had the presidential search committee before. Right. Um, and so to see how that um, integrated with the standing committee um, was definitely a learning, you know, uh, a learning growing edge to really see, you know, as Michael said, you know, the, the entry to some of these positions is, is really prohibitive um, for a lot of folks and particularly the moderator position 
which is a volunteer position, um, may, is been, you know, just there, there are a lot of barriers to being, to being able to serve in that role. Um, so I'm really grateful that, that there's a lot of folks taking a look at it. The board has been taking a look at it um, for the past year and will continue for this next year. Um, February 1st was the deadline for anybody to run for moderator by nomination by petition. And we didn't receive, or they didn't receive any to my knowledge. Um, so, you know, that gives the board one more year to really try and nail down um, the description, the job description for moderator and what that can look like and how, um, you know, how wide, um, that wider they can make it um, to be able to serve. So I'm, I'm excited that they're gonna have um, that additional year to do that work. So um, by petition, so that means the board will again appoint the moderator? Correct. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's my understanding that they will appoint it you'll appoint it for a, until a special election can be held, the next special election can be held, which is um, GA 2020, um, which is Providence, um, so. And it is search season. So there are congregational search committees, very hard at work. Shout out to all of you. I, I am awed by the amount of work that goes into those search committees and, and, and to the colleagues who are in search. I think, um, who was saying, Michael, were you saying it's the smallest number of colleagues in a while that are in search right now? I think, uh, I think Nancy brought Nancy. it up in our, in our post uh, show chat, but I think it's the smallest number of ministers in search since the UUA has been keeping records um, of that number, which is, which is fairly astounding. Which, and and it means a lot of congregational search committees will be in the second round or maybe even the third round of search and that's not a bad thing it's it's better that you go into the second round to get a minister that you're well matched with um so but you're not alone and our love goes out to those committees who are going to have to do some extra work nancy you you had a pastoral word for them too michael may have said what you wanted to say but well actually you made it so gracious and warm when you said maybe this is because in this era of trump People want to stay in their contexts, in their congregations, and know that doing this work can make a difference. So maybe we see less uh, volatility and mobility, uh, less people leaving their pulpits. Perhaps also we're seeing people doing parachurch ministries, ministries outside of congregational settings, which I think if you talk to our folks at the seminaries would certainly validate that. But it will put extra stress on those search committees. So just know it's normal. You're not alone. We're in it together. Stay in the game. And nothing wrong with an extra interim year either. Nope. Says, says the interim minister, you know, good stuff can happen in an interim year. So I, you know, I continue to have fun in this little experiment of a team of us sharing one interim position. I'm 25%, two other people are sharing it. And I think it's a really good model and the UUA should really think about it for other places because the congregation gets to see three ministers who are very different and we'll, we'll argue with each other in meetings about stuff. <laughs> You know, and we disagree, which which in conflict avoidant congregations is also a gift for them. So, you know, like we don't it doesn't come to blows. We just disagree. So anyway. And while, while we're talking about congregations searching for professionals, um, I want to give a shout out to Tim Atkins, who's the religious educator at Cedar Lane across Bethesda from from Nancy, um, who posted something on Facebook this week that I thought was just really insightful about how congregations can do search for religious educators better um, and really um, paying attention to uh, the fact that we put all of this uh, effort and process into ministerial search um, and that just even a little more uh, effort and process in, the, in searches for religious educators will convince, con convince religious educators that those congregations are worth serving because they take them seriously as professionals. So a shout out to Tim. Yeah, not, and I will say that that post is public um, and it gives really concrete um, suggestions to congregations on how to um, take a look at their search process. So it's not just like, hey, treat us better. It's actually like, 
here's the things that we're looking for. Um, here's the things that turn us off. Here are the, when we see this, we see red flag. Um, so maybe y'all, you know, might want to discuss that before you, <laughs> you put that out there. Um, it, it was really insightful and, and, and it could be very helpful for congregations. So yeah, definitely take a look at Tim's, uh, Tim's page. And a good advice I got was um, that that job or uh, not job descriptions, the listing of what um, people are looking for is out of their anxiety. So there was so, a religious educator once told me they saw in the um, posting uh, something about smiling. And she said, how surly was the religious educator before me that they literally have to list that you have to smile at people as part of what they're looking for. So maybe ask those questions when you're looking at what's being posted. <laughs> <laughs> what happened before? That's really true of ministerial searches too. <laughs> Do you go to coffee hour? I mean, yeah, exactly. Very funny things. Yeah, exactly. Well, I'm excited today to be joined by Nancy McDonald Ladd, who's written a new book, which, I mean, I'll stop by saying, did you deliberately, is that a tongue in cheek title that you gave with that after the good news? I just, it's yes. not, it, I just thought it made me smile just to see the cover. Like, <laughs> <laughs> that was a little bit of my humor in the midst of it. Because when you're talking about some serious business, which this book does, to make it a narrative you can follow and access, I have to be in there too. And I'm, you know me, Meg, I'm not 100% serious at all times. So there's a bit of Nanciness. Well, in happily, there's a bit of Nanciness here, quite a bit. The subtitle is Progressive Faith Beyond Optimism. So what what compelled you? you? Obviously, writing a book takes a whole lot of time and energy. So you got a lot of time and energy around this topic. What what compelled you to write it? Well, so the frame of the book is a lot of my personal history, but the fundamental critique of the book, I think, is a real hard theological look at both progressive religions over optimism about human nature and progressivism's over optimism about the arc of history and how all that business is tied up in white supremacy um, and white supremacy culture. But for me, what kicked it off is that I, as I put in the book, I grew up in the shadow of two dead utopias. So I grew up outside of New Harmony, Indiana, which was the location of the 19th century's like biggest failure of progressive, do-gooder, rich white people trying to build a perfect world. And it was a disaster mostly on the level of benevolent paternalism. So my hometown is a monument to benevolent paternalism. And I became a Unitarian Universalist and started walking the halls of the Liberal Religious Academy, feeling uneasy about certain aspects of the optimism present in liberal religious and UU culture. And I finally figured out I was uneasy about that because part of what I was seeing was strains of benevolent paternalism tied to white supremacy culture that felt an awful lot like the disasters uh, that predated my generation in my own hometown. And I felt like we need to name that. We need to talk about the ways that this premise of moving onward and upward forever and unfailing intellectual and scientific advancement is tied with patriarchy and is tied with white supremacy culture. And we need to talk about the ways that makes us more fragile um, and frankly, less able to love each other authentically. So say more about the benevolent, <laughs> benevolent paternalism. So at the crux of it, um, and a lot of what's in this book is like not groundbreaking, it's not new, it's just like me naming things that, uh, that so many of us have been surfacing. So at the heart of it is this idea, as I write in the book, I have never believed that well-intentioned groups of highly educated white liberals could save the world especially that those well-intentioned groups of highly educated white liberals could save the world on behalf of persons of color or persons with marginalized identities, that there is an inherent hubris in any social justice outreach or world-shaping enterprise that has at its heart the idea that highly educated white liberals will do these benevolent things for other persons, right? And the only way to get out of that benevolent paternalism, I think, 
is deep engagement uh, about the ways in which um, the Eurocentric churches are complicit in that um, um, broken system that they're claiming to be fixing on behalf of others, and the ways in which um, people with privileged identities in our congregations are broken too. So if we are trying to fix a broken system, we're not fixing it for other people um, out of this place of um, benevolent paternalism, but we're fixing it because we're all caught in it and we're all broken. Um, and as wise people say, we can't get free until we all get free together. And we can't get free until we acknowledge our place in what binds us and keeps us from being free. So in the book, I talk about how that frankly includes atonement, um, theology and practice that includes atonement and lament in liberal congregations and not shying away from that and not seeing that as a source of shame, but a source of authenticity and power. And atonement is super hard for us, man. <laughs> so Nancy, who would you see as the audience for this book? Like who, who is it that, that you were writing this for? So that's a good question. And we went back and forth on it with Skinner House a lot. So we pitched this intentionally to the left side of American Protestantism, because the issues that are, I'm raising in this book are not unique to Unitarian Universalism. They're present throughout the sort of progressive church uh, communities. My examples come almost entirely from Unitarian Universalism because that's my context, right? And then within our faith tradition, I think there are, there are moments in this book where I'm speaking from my experience and I'm speaking a critique to those with privileged identities within largely Eurocentric congregations of our movement. But when I'm doing that, I'm clear to name the we, right? That if I am speaking a we that is mostly to people with privileged identities in congregations that are mostly white, I name that. And when my we is intended to be our faith as Unitarian Universalists, I name that too. So I try to check the we uh, and move in and out of, of that throughout the text of the book. So I think for the most part, it's for clergy, for dedicated lay leaders within progressive religion. Um, there is there's some real theology in it. So it's not a beach read, uh, but if you care about the culture and the liturgy of progressive congregations, that's who it's for. Well, let's talk about liturgy a little bit because um, atonement, mm -hmm. how, how, do you, how, do you, how do you bring that into liturgy at a place like River Road or the other churches that you've served? Or how do you, you know, we have Rob Eller Isaac's one reading that we do over and over. Exactly. <laughs> that's pretty much it that we have for atonement. And I'm just curious if you've had meaningful um, Unitarian Universalists not poaching on Judaism or other, other traditions right. that do a lot better than we do, but I'm curious if you've developed liturgy. And that's the other thing we do besides do Rob Eller Isaac's one reading is we all kind of preach the same sermon on Yom Kippur about how atonement is at one mint and like we've all preached that sermon and it's a good sermon, but still that's a beginning place. So um, I, I admit in this book that atonement is a profoundly vulnerable thing um, in progressive spaces and also that if we are out of practice with atonement, with a regular um, encountering of our authentic selves, including our limitations, if we are out of practice with atonement, then when anyone holds up a mirror to us, any of us, and says, here's what is outside of, here's what has been outside of your perception, here's what I am experiencing that is not whole, we are too fragile to meet that encounter with love, right? And too often in our congregations with a predominantly um, sort of white normative culture, when we are out of practice with individual or collective atonement, the person holding up the mirror is a person of color or a person with a marginalized identity. 
And if we are out of practice with atonement, we kick back with fragility against that mirror that is held up to us. So if we want to relate authentically, if we want to not retreat into the fragility that we so often encounter, it behooves us to be individually and collectively in practice with atonement. So I talk about the fact that um, litur liturgies of lament are probably a little easier in, say, the main sanctuary of your typical Sunday morning service uh, in a UU congregation. Liturgies of atonement are harder because they require deep vulnerability and trust. And so while that can happen in the main sanctuary, you got to earn it. You cannot assume you have that trust. You have to earn it. And maybe a place to start is in our small group liturgies and our small group worship um, and the places where trust can be more um, authentically built. And I, our amazing editors at Skinner House actually asked me to include, uh, um, I don't know, what do you call it? Like an addendum at the end of the book talking about how you could do this, how we could do this together. So I think you build a culture of atonement starting at the small scale and reaching up into the sanctuary, not starting in the sanctuary and reaching down. Um, and there's also uh, some writing in here about what it is to have a regular and honest encounter with oneself. So atonement as a component of spiritual practice, not because some minister is telling you to, but because it is a way to be less alienated from your authentic self and thus a way to be real together. Oh, I am so appreciative. I can't wait to read this book now. I haven't read it yet, but I will. Um, one of the things that, that was super uh, clear to me for the last few years, but especially after uh, spring of 2017 um, with the white supremacy teaching movement at the beginning is the way we have failed our people I'm talking now to ordained clergy, religious educators, we have failed our people since 61 in teaching them how to sit in discomfort and do exactly what you're talking about is learn how to be hu humble, mm -hmm. um, vulnerable, atonement, because as soon as we went, you know, the merger happened and we took on the Unitarian intellectual, we're so smart and great, you just need to read the right books. And we really don't have much to atone for because we don't believe in the nonsense of blah, blah, blah. So. This is where, I mean, we could start now. It's never too late, right, to have a good childhood. So it's never too late to have the religion and the faith community that's, that, that affirms liberation and affirms um, that we have a lot to atone for. We, we do, the, we being Unitarian Universalism. And, and the more we pretend we don't, the more we simply, the fragility comes out, I've seen not just white fragility, I've seen ordained ministerial fragility, I've seen fragility among board presidents, I've seen fragility. So this is a, it's so in our DNA and we need to deconstruct that. So I appreciate exactly your framing. Yeah. And the more we can deconstruct that, the more we can access authentic relationships. And it is only in authentic relationships where we tell truth instead of like bullshit around it. It is only in authentic relationships that we can do real social change. And real social change is not an abstraction or an idea. It is something lived out among people in real relationship. I was thinking even with Rob L. Isaac's um, reading that we know so well, that when they put it in the hymnal, they changed it. He was very upset about it because the ritual that he did in Oakland was that two people would turn to each other and say something, say one of those lines, and then they would say, I forgive myself, I forgive you, we begin again in love. And the hymnal people were like, yeah, that's that's too, I don't know what they said too, but they, it was like, no, that's not good liturgically. We forgive ourselves and we forgive each other. And and we constantly abstract ourselves. We, we should we need it? I'm not sure it would be me. I mean, we just take it out of our own lived experience, which, which is that daily we screw up and hurt people and do things we wish we wouldn't do. And, you know, I mean, yesterday I posted on Facebook, I hate it when I hurt people because I had just done something stupid that hurt someone and I knew it did and I felt really bad about it. And, you know, a lot of people just were witnessing, but some people were just like, you're human, you're human. And it was sort of like, don't, don't be uncomfortable. And I was, I just thought, and I wrote my newsletter from that place too of 
having not yet heard back from the person. So in that horrible time when you're like, will they ever forgive me, you know? And yeah. I thought this is a good place to actually share because everyone goes here and to say, here I am, it sucks, you know what, I'm gonna go on, life is gonna go on. Um, I think it's so, I mean, I didn't get specific about what I'd done. For one thing, everyone can project their own failures, but, but for another thing, it would be great to have a place like a regular place you know and i do it personally but to kind of go back and say what happened today you know it's certainly part of recovery for a lot of addicts i know mm -hmm. to do that daily practice well i'm curious about the this sort of theological bent that you use have that that church is supposed to just make you feel good or there's some relationship between inherent worth and dignity and feeling good all the time. I, would you talk about that? Um, I find that theologically problematic, but it seems Amen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, to say the least problematic. And some of that is um, connected to how we framed liturgy, liturgy over the years. So I uh, will often hear liturgy reframed as a celebration of life. But as Rob Eller Isaacs actually has often told me, remember in that sanctuary, there's always someone with a broken heart. Remember in that sanctuary, there's always someone who has let themselves down in that sanctuary as someone who is celebrating the greatest joy of their life. If we are not attending to each other's actual experience, but instead attending to an abstract notion of uh, beauty, justice, benevolence, and upward progress, then we're we're actually pastorally letting each other down profoundly. Um, and in the book, I write again, not only of atonement, but of liturgies of lament and what it is. And we do this better in my congregation than we do collective liturgies of atonement. What it is to actually meet each other, not in the performance of perfection, but in the authentic spaces where perfection isn't required. And I actually tell the story of my grandma. Um, and it's one of those, you know, I could be a politician with this story. Like she literally hitchhiked to work for 30 years in high heeled shoes and was a widow who raised her four sons on a waitress tips, all that stuff, right? But the, the important part is that my grandma for years would take her four sons to Sunday school at the local UCC congregation. And she would like paste down their cowlicks and put them in their good outfits and she would leave. She would leave and walk away and come back an hour later because what the progressive church had telegraphed to her at that time was that they could see nothing in her but her poverty and the presumed tragedy inherent in her story. And she believed her sons belonged in the community of saints because they at least had a shot of reaching toward that perfectibility that the community of saints is always talking about, but she didn't because all people could see in her was their perception of her need. Um, and she pledged to that church for 30 years and never went. So I, I think a lot about what it would be like for my grandma to come to my congregation and, you know, see all the Priuses parked out there and get back on the city bus and leave after dropping my family off at this door. So we cannot create spaces where we curate a performance of upper middle class, um, white respectability, and think that we're actually gonna encounter God. <laughs> Cause that ain't how it works, you know? I love Nancy, the way you put it just a few moments ago, you said the performance of perfection. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I think about the, the pressure that's on me as a minister uh, to do that, right? Mm -hmm. And to not, um, to not like actually be a whole human being. Right. And, and how soul sucking it is if I buy into that, right? Um, you know, if I buy, if I buy into that, I need to perform perfection to the congregation. It, 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 it sucks a part of my soul out. Mm -hmm. um, and just how freeing it's been to just say, hey, you know what, I'm a human being and I hurt people and I make mistakes and like I learn from those mistakes if, if I'm lucky. Uh, 
um, and paying attention and in real relationship and just how, how people have responded with, um, thank you for like being a human being, mm -hmm. which is like cr almost craziness. Like, it's just, I don't even know where, where to put that. Um, I, so I, I, I like the way you put that. And, and I'm wondering if you might say more about the performance of perfection in our congregations. So um, first of all, the fact that you've cultivated that in your congregation and in your ministry, it shouldn't be as special and precious as it is, but it is like, right. Good on you for cultivating that with your people. And as we are, what do we say? A learning community instead of a learned community. Part of we, what we need to keep learning is the humility to be deeply human while still upholding the boundaries that are always called for in parish ministry. And that is not necessarily easy and it requires ongoing commitment and dedication. So I think you're a model of a minister who shows that and who has inculcated that in your relationship with your people. And we need to help others learn how to do that. Um, the other two things to name is that as much as congregations expect me as a upper middle class, white, highly educated, middle-aged, cis, straight lady to perform my intelligence and perform my perfectibility. They expect it doubly and triply so um, for people with identities outside of the congregation's like normative cultures. So especially clergy of culture, I, uh, cler clergy of color, I see again and again and again an unwillingness on the part of our congregations to let those clergy be human, let them make mistakes, let them not be perfect. And I'm, you know, it just reels these time. So often congregations call a minister of color, especially an African-American minister and expect them to be black Jesus. And the minute they show themselves to be a human, a human working, struggling, learning, the kickback on that is so painful and so rapid. And we need to be talking about that. Um, accountability, excellence, all these things are important and permission to be a human is important. Um, and then the other piece of this puzzle is that the way we have curated an understanding of perfection is itself tied to white supremacy culture so you go, you go all the way back to Channing, right? So William Ellery Channing believed that human beings through this practice of highly intellectual self-culture could in time and with the right practices be likened unto God, right? And that pain and suffering were this sort of filter that kept us from accessing our potential likeness unto God. The problem, of course, is that the people who had the leisure and the money and the time to do this cultivated sitting in a garret somewhere reading books, self-culture happened to be mostly cultivated, educated white men. And the people experiencing the very kind of pain and, and liminal spaces and um, suffering that made it hard to practice this self-culture were people of color and women and people without uh, economic access. So we have cultivated our image of perfection to look an awful lot like an educated upper class white dude. And so I don't wanna perform that. Um, and as a, I came into ministry as a 25 year old woman, there are ways in those early years that I performed a model of perfection that worked within the system because the system affirmed that. And I don't wanna pretend that, and I don't anymore. I don't have to, because I have enough privileged identities to carry me through, but we shouldn't expect that of any of us. No, and I, I also, can, I kind of call it the minister role. I've definitely seen that in folks, but I want to uh, lift up that we have, we have an audience and it's always cool to lift up their comments. So Ty Resende de Perez says, only folks who are used to comfort and privilege think that faith could always feel good, in quotes. And Janine Gelsinger says, some of the best services I've been in haven't made me feel good at all. Sitting in discomfort is deeply important. And uh, Ty responded, authentic relationships when Mike was talk Michael was talking, one key has to be non-hierarchical um, communication. 
And Ty also continues, it's so painful and so rapid, it is impossible to do collaborative leadership is the minister isn't allowed to, to be, to like to be human and has comfort and humility, or maybe are, are maybe afraid of being, of um, showing um, vulnerability. And I, I wonder, Nancy, because one of the things that I, that is concerning to me or, or I feel sad about is how, what I've from, I'm not in the UUMA, I'm not a minister, I'm a religious educator. Um, Sometimes what I see ordained clergy kind of how they how you are with each other and how that reinforces white supremacy culture and reinforces the role and reinforces what you know how you were in the beginning you were saying. So is that starting to change? I mean, I, I know we heard in the beginning that it is, but I also have heard there's a lot of pushback to that. Um is it started? Actually, I'm going to have Meg help me answer this question. Maybe is it starting to change? I think so. Um, I'm not sure I'm always helping because one of the things that I do, because I don't want to buy into this sort of braggadocia performance of smarty pants, patriarchal stuff is I will, I will intentionally undercut myself. So I will say in collegial spaces, things like, oh, I know you've been working on this for 30 years and I'm not so much, but blah, blah, blah. Or I will intentionally, even about this book, I have to catch myself in this gendered nonsense where I will undercut my own wisdom in order to feel like I can stay at the table and not be too big for my britches. And I'll say things to colleagues like, I know this whole text is really depressing, but you should really still read it. And what I'm what I'm saying when I do that, my colleague Paige Getty called me out on this because she's a truth teller. When I do that bunk, uh, what I am expressing is my own discomfort with sitting with the truth I have spoken and a way of saying, but don't be mad at me. I'm going to lay some truth bombs on y'all, but don't be mad at me because I'm still really on your team. So I think what we have to do is cultivate, cultivate a willingness in ourselves to speak truth with each other and then not back down and not water it down and not make it cozy. And I fight it in me as much or more than anybody else. Have you, what do you think, Meg? Do you think our culture among colleagues is changing? Well, thank you for that. I recognize myself in some way. You just said, ouch. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I think it's changing as, I mean, when I came in, it was the old guys who got drunk all the time, right? And, oh, and me too. Yeah. <laughs> really? Even, oh God, I'm so sorry. Because that, that feels like it's pretty over now. Mm -hmm. The old drunk guys are pretty over. They're, they might be old and drunk, but they're not at collegial gatherings anymore. Um, I, what I see is really helping. I think that that first year ministers thing that Alicia has been doing for a few years has really built some very, what I observe as very vulnerable, real relationships among clergy who come in when everybody's so like, what the hell is going on at first, you know, um, and catch each other. And I, and I just, I know from a lot of the former fellows that do that, that that is where they find real honesty and accountability and vulnerability in a, in a small group. I think that the increased number of trans ministers, people of color, um, has shifted the culture some, not as much as I wish, but I feel like it's, you, you can't just assume anything the way it used to just roll like a steamroller over at any of the marginalized people, because there's more visibility of the margins, still not in the center, but in more visibility. Um, and, and often, I think, you know, it's just such a different time that we're in that I think um, those of us who are white have so much more opportunity to learn about specifically what that means. I mean, I was doing anti-racism work for years before anyone talked about whiteness. You know, we always talked about oppression and racism, but no one ever said, here is what you're doing and described it and held up a mirror. And it was like, right, <laughs> exactly, you know? So I feel like some of the um, academic stuff has come in and some of the non-academic stuff that's been there forever, but, but because 
the channels that led it in to Unitarian Universalism have finally seen it. You know, I mean, James Baldwin said anything you might have wanted to say, you know, decades and decades ago. But because other people are bringing it in, you know, white learned people are bringing it in, I think more white people are hearing it. So shifting slowly, but, you know, I feel like what the other cultural thing is just the how marginalized religious life is period and church is period and um i would wish that that was more humbling to people instead it seems to fill some people with real self-righteousness <laughs> whereas to me it's like this is a logical response to what we've done you know it's sad to me but um it's not unexplainable so anyway Can answer but stumbling i want to go back to what ty wrote in the comments about it's impossible to do collaborative leadership if the minister isn't allowed to be human and i feel like there's some um i don't know there's some resentment it feels like among ministers and what is sort of expected of them that plays into this need to to be set up part and have a certain amount of power and I feel like it's a there's some feedback loop there that needs to be disrupted I feel like well and it and it goes to you know you can't if you're not expecting your minister or the person who's serving as your ordained clergy person to be human are you also not allowing that grace for yourself right and so, you know, that is one of the things that I miss deeply about Catholicism is that it required me on a weekly basis to reflect on who I had harmed. And, um, and it's hard to get, you know, too big for your br britches <laughs> when culturally every week you're thinking about, you know, how, how have I not been um, not only how have I not been my best about my best self, but how have I been human and, you know, and have a way to, you know, as part of kind of what you were talking about as part of either liturgy or, or acts of atonement, um, be able to recognize that, recognize it's part of the human condition and move on from it. Um, and, and we don't have that in Unitarian Universalism. Like that, that reflection just is not part of our culture. And I'm not saying Catholicism has it perfectly right because their idea of how you atone for that is not what I would, would have for us, but the, the practice of having to, you know, ritually, um, figure out how, you, how you've been human, um, I think would benefit not just us, but also our relationship with, with our, our, our clergy, our, our professional, religious professionals. And that those kind of practices are available to us. And they're available to us, not by sort of returning to some Calvinist doom and gloom nonsense, but within our actual Unitarian Universalist theological tradition. Um, and even if you go just straight back to Universalism and Hosea Ballou, Hosea Ballou never actually argued that human beings are perfect. What he argued was that God was like this love vacuum that was just going to keep going until that love vacuum got us all. So it was the extraordinary power of that grace always working, that had the power to bring all souls into harmony with the divine. Not that each individual soul was supposed to be so perfect, or that we ourselves were the agents of every form of perfection, but that there was a greater love working in and through us, even in our imperfection. And, and we've sometimes mistranslated the universalist tradition to be a fundamental faith in human goodness. And then mistranslated it to be a fundamental faith in our own individual innocence, right? But that's not, that's not where our tradition necessarily leads us. 
And I, I grew up Catholic. My journey with Catholicism is all over this book. Um, I am not an angry ex-Catholic. I also, as a Unitarian Universalist, am exactly where I belong uh, for reasons that are, for which I am deeply grateful. And I wouldn't take it back for the world, this journey. But it was my Catholic tradition that gave me a personal language and a personal practice around what the Jesuits would call the practice of examine. So regular self-examination. So my personal liturgies of self-examination are not ones that I found in my Unitarian Universalist space. They're ones I imported from my personal history. But we can build them in our Unitarian Universalist faith. We can. And I don't even think it's that much of a theological stretch to do so. Well, I mean, I even... ...ported or okay, but we could do better. Michael, go ahead. I, you know, I think you brought up William Ellery Channing and self-culture earlier, and I wonder if it's time to recast that. Uh, it, you know, because self-culture is this idea of growing ourselves, right? And he wrote about it like, like we're growing plants, like agriculture or horticulture, there's self-culture. And missed the whole point that like when you're like growing a plant in the garden, you, you get dirty and you have to like put manure in the soil and, <laughs> um, and compost things and weed it. And uh, there's work and there's dirt and there's mess involved in that. It's not some like pristine sitting and reading a book in a cloister uh, thing that that is what he was thinking humans should do. And you're right to name that as this privileged uh, place. Um, but that's not what growth, what what actually makes things grow. Either. Isn't, that, isn't that beautiful? Like, we don't have to abandon the theological inheritance from Channing, that Channing brought 19th century liberal religion to to this view of self-culture, of cultivating the self, of growing the self, that is not wrong, that is all good. We need to contextualize it in, in ways that are separated from patriarch, patriarchy and oppression. And we can do that. We have a received theological tradition that is ripe for reinterpretation if we grapple with it first, instead of just, um, I don't know, like spit it out like slogans. And that reframing that you just said, Michael, is spot on. Yes, if you're going to grow a plant, you're going to get dirty. If you're going to cultivate a soul, you're going to have to encounter the ways in which that soul is broken. Yeah. We There's do. such a lively conversation going on on Facebook. I just want to name it. We don't have time to say all the comments, but I hope if you're listening to this podcast, you can read because a lot of smart people are saying really interesting things. I wanted to ask one question that's coming out of it. Uh, one person who is the spouse of a clergy person said, I'm reflecting on how some I know who lean more humanist tend to allow the least amount of humanity from their minister. And I wonder if you see things in the humanist tradition also that could be uh, um, that are useful to, to draw in here um, uh, in terms of humanism and humility specifically. Um, well, not to toot my own institutional horn too much, but uh, in terms of the late greats of Unitarian Universalist humanism, uh, there is none more attached to actual humility than Bill Murray, who actually was the senior minister here at River Road, who kept offering this continual corrective to, um, to some of the prickly performance of intellectualism all around him, he kept saying, we have to be humanists with heart, you know, and I know that sounds slogany and it is, but the, the legacy of that is that in my congregation, which is as historically humanist as any congregation you're going to find in the UUA, we have not put down these stakes that say, if you ever say the word God, you're done here. We have not created a prickly privileged humanism here. We've created a humanism that's willing to explore. So that's possible because some folks in generations before planted seeds for it. And I would say now we need to be looking at um, new and emerging voices and different voices within humanism. Uh, like Anthony Penn, I write in the book about Anthony Penn's understanding of human nature. Now he's totally a non-theist. So he would totally disagree with this idea that it is God's love that is sucking us upward. And while humans may be uh, full of potential and kind of broken, it's God's love. He wouldn't have any truck with all that. 
but he would say our fundamental nature is as embodied beings. We are embodied beings. And when we are living in such a way that these bodies are safe and that these bodies can thrive and grow, then we are living out the truth of our human potential. So there's the theology is there. Uh, an anti-oppressive, multi, uh, many-lensed non-theism is just rich and exciting. We had him on, and I would say, <laughs> what a mind. Oh, my gosh. We're all just... Uh, he he actually changed the liturgy in my congregation <laughs> with, with his comments. I'm like, okay, I can do this differently, um, which was was pretty great. See, it's like right there. Just got to get it. Well, Nancy, we're, we're coming to the top of the hour. I wonder if, if there's something you haven't gotten to say about your book that you really would like to say, besides that everyone could read it, of course. Yeah, definitely. Um, just that it... I really believe that these conversations are conversations that need to be had. Um, and what I want most of all is actually, it's great if people buy the book, that's awesome, do that. But what I really want is for people to have these conversations and to figure out ways to deepen these conversations. So in as much as possible, don't get together and debate the book, like whatever, that's fine. Get together and talk about the ways in which we can cultivate greater authenticity and greater power and less fragility in our congregations. And if it does that, if it's a part of a flow of a conversation, that's what I wanted to do. This is not meant to be the intellectual first or last word on any dang thing. It's meant to be a conversation that is ongoing. Well, it's been wonderful to have this conversation today. Anybody else got anything you... Uh... I burn in to say so we say goodbye. Y'all, it's been wonderful. What is that? Is that me? Um, next week, because it's Valentine's Day, we're gonna have the side with love folks on, and that'll be fun. And um, yeah, thank you so much, Nancy. This really was a very deep and provocative conversation. I'm really grateful for all of the people who shared in the writing, and I look forward to reading that later and having some more conversation with you all. Thanks for being here and um, see you next time. Thank you.